you stay standing for the reading of God's word this morning. <clears throat> it's gonna come out of Isaiah 58. Hear the word of the Lord. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, if you honor it by not going your own way, not speaking and doing of your own will and way, then you will find your joy in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride in triumphant on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your fathers, Jacob. From the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. What a beautiful, beautiful day together. We've been in this series, Shabbat, as we've looked at Sabbath over the last, this is our fourth week of the series. We've got two more weeks to go. And uh, we have looked at stopping. Just what is Sabbath? Where does God call us to it? How does God call us to it? Then we looked at week two, what does it mean to set aside a 24-hour period? And we know that that's hard. That our lives are busy and going and going and going. And so it's, it's difficult sometimes. And so for some of us, it's just how do we stop for a meal? How do we stop for half a day? Eventually, maybe for a whole day. And then last week, Pastor Sorensen took us through the journey of how do we rest with Jesus? How do we rest? And today, we look at how do we delight how do we delight with God? And so when I started thinking about delighting with God and delighting on the Sabbath, here's what came to my mind, was something that happened at our house, I don't know, six months ago or so. And so here, living in the woodlands, we realized that there was gonna be this weekend, um, a little bit because of our church and some other circumstances, that some of our best friends from around the country were all gonna be in town together. Now, a lot of you know I moved here from Nashville, uh, seven, or not seven, I was in Nashville for eight years, but, but we lived, moved here about a year and a half ago. People were always in Nashville coming to visit. And um, every bachelorette party, you can imagine that we knew somebody that went, was getting married, they all would show up. And so we always had people over. But since moving to the Woodlands, like just the natural nature of, of living here, a lot of our outside friends had not made it to Houston yet. And so we were excited. And so I told Claire, my wife, I said, hey, let's, let's have a gathering. Let's have a dinner. And she was like, that sounds incredible. And so we went to work. It was going to be a Friday night at our house. And so my wife works Monday through Friday. I work Sunday through Thursday. So this worked out really well. And uh, so I got up that morning. My daughter went to school, and I started cleaning the house. Now, men, I think you know this, um, but just in case you don't, there is a difference in cleaning and tidying up. And uh, I've been taught for 10 years now there's a big difference. I tidy up really well. I don't always clean really well, but I tidy up. But that day, Claire was like, I need you to clean. I was like, I got you. And so I cleaned. I did baseball. I did all the stuff. And so clean the whole house. And then about 11 a.m. that morning, I go over to HEB. I buy all the stuff. Now, when I say I buy all the stuff, I've worked on a menu for a week and a half of what we're going to have that night. I told y'all I'm a low, I'm a low key foodie. Like I want to be, I can't be, but I want to be. So dinner night in my house is going to be good. So we, I go, I make all the phone calls to everybody coming. What's your allergy? What's the thing that you can't eat? What's the thing you don't even like? And so we put together a menu. I go to HEB. I get everything. And then starting about 12 o'clock, dinner is at seven, I start the process. I start cooking. I start putting everything together. I start seasoning. Steaks that were gonna be reverse seared started yesterday, you know, because you gotta overnight those things to get real flavor. Anyway, and so, y'all like, Pierce, just get to the point. And so, <laughs> so we are, we're doing it, and we're getting there, and, and everybody shows up at seven o'clock, and everything comes off the grill at the right time. Everything hits the plates at the right time. I mean, we've done it to perfection. And my wife makes this beautiful charcuterie board. We're just like hanging out around it. We move to the table. We eat, and we just start sharing stories. Now, there was no one at the table who didn't know everyone at the table. So everybody knew each other. We weren't all great friends. We were kind of the common bond between everybody, but everybody knew of everybody, where they lived, their kind of life story. So we very quickly go 
going to not, hey, what's your name? It's, hey, how's that going in your life? How's your grandkids doing? How's your kid doing? How's the new business? How's the church going? All those kind of things. And we just start sharing. Well, the dinner goes great. We sit down, we finish that, and then my wife brings out dessert. And we cut the dessert all up, and we, we pass it out, and we're sitting there. And I'm about halfway through with my dessert, and it hits me. Rest. Like I had been prepping all this stuff. We've been working all week on the house, getting it ready, final touches, having everybody over. Could not be more excited about it. Then the moment came and we ate, and you know, as the cook, I wanna make sure it tastes good and did you like it, did you enjoy it? Everybody's like, so now we're at the dessert, which is like ice cream and pie, which is like my favorite. So it's like, I know you enjoy it. And so we're, we're eating it and it's just like that wait, it's over, but now we get to just enjoy. You know what I'm talking about? moment of just like, the work has been done. It was good work. It was holy work. On these dinner parties, one of the things that I do um, that actually got taught to me by um, a a female pastor in Oklahoma, she cooked for us one night when we were at her church, and we've been working there doing some missional work. And as she cooked and prepared, um, we all came in at the time of the dinner, and there was about 15 of us there. And she, she prayed over the meal and before, like we start hopping in line and she goes, before you take your food, I need to tell you something. We're like, okay, yeah. And she explains the meal and then she goes this. She says, um, when I made the, the, the dough for these tacos, she said, I, I, I made the dough myself. And then she pulled out a piece of paper and she goes, I prayed for Pierce and for Kevin. And this is what I prayed for you about. She starts telling me how she prayed for us. She says, when I got to the ground beef and to, the, uh, to this, I was praying for she prison meal for Sarah and for Emily. Everything that she had cooked, when she cooked it, she knew who was gonna be at her table and she prayed for us individually as she cooked. It was one of the most impactful things of my life. And I don't say that casually. And so I've been praying over this meal and praying over these people, taken from what she had taught me. And I learned just at the end just to relax. Sabbath. See, that's what I think Sabbath is. Sabbath is not escaping this world and, and, and just getting away to lay on a couch for eight hours and binge watch whatever or watch football all day and, or whatever it may be. I'm, I love all those things, but that's not what Sabbath is. And Sabbath is not because we are burned out. Like I understand we are dealing with things, but if you look at Jesus's life and God the Father and Jesus, Holy Spirit, they created all things and on the seventh day they called it holy. It's not because they were tired. But it's like after finishing some good, hard work to sit down and to go, it is good and it's holy. And we sat around that meal that night and shared just great conversation as you can imagine. And not only did we delight in the meal and delight in within each other, we delighted in the Lord. Like in the communion table, one of the things that scripture shows is says that we'll do this every time we gather and there's a holiness to this table of communion that we believe God shows up in a, in a mysterious way and, and, and becomes for us in this, his presence. And that can also happen at your dinner table with your friends and with your family to have communion with them, to, to do this together. And so when we look at delighting in the Lord, what I don't want us to do is to look at delight as, like, as, as just like, pleasure seeking for pleasure seeking sake. But what does it mean to delight in the Lord who created you and called you and made you his own? Rich Velotis, who is a pastor in New York City and has written some incredible books. I, I, there's, a, there's like three of them that are just really good. Go on Amazon, buy anything he's written. He's really great. And uh, he said this recently. He said, I find more people in the church have a, a deficiency of delight and joy instead of an abundance of feasting with the Lord. Let me say that again. I find more people in the church have a deficiency in delight and joy instead of an abundance of feasting too much. We should be, we should be the most joyful people, the most loving people. 
and I know that the rain, rain falls on the just and the unjust, and we're carrying in things. And, and even to this day, I prayed with someone this morning that is going through um, some of the worst things I could ever imagine. And so I understand we carry these things in here. But we also carry Jesus with us. And we get to delight in who he is. And so the Sabbath is a day for you to be artistic, for you to be creative with your delighting in the Lord. Because here's the, what's happened, right? We have said, we all stop. For 24 hours, we're gonna attempt to stop and to call that holy and to be with God. Yes, all of us stop. All of us need to rest. Our bodies need rest. There's something beautiful about the fact that most Sabbaths go from sundown to sundown. So it's not sun up to sundown, it's sundown to sundown. This idea that we're gonna gather at a table, have a really good meal together with friends and family. And, and it's really, although I love the food, it really is the company that makes the meal good. And so we have a good meal together and then we rest our bodies. We go to bed and then we wake up. And it takes intentionality. It takes intentionality. Hear this quote, he said this uh, from the book, The Sabbath. He says this, labor is a craft but perfect rest is an art. I love that. Labor is a craft, but perfect rest is an art. Now, here's what I know. This many people in the room, everybody doesn't feel like a creative. Everybody doesn't feel like an artist in the room. But the reality is, even though you don't feel maybe creative or feel like an artist, I would say this, that God not only formed you in your mother's womb and called you his own and knit you together, he made your fingerprint more unique than anybody else's in the world. You are unique in this world. Now, yes, you hold common things in this world with other people. You share likes and dislikes. You share rhythms of life. You share a house. You share a marriage. You share parenting. You share being a child, all the different things. There's a lot that keeps us in common, but don't get me wrong, you are unique. God has created you that way. And so for me, on this side of delight, is my question for us this morning is this, how can we find the way? Your way is not gonna be my way, and my way is not gonna be your way. But how can you find the ways that you were created by God to connect with God? And in those things, begin to practice those on Sabbath specifically to delight with him. I think there's three ways we can do delighting with God this morning and on our Sabbath. And the first is this, is simply to delight with God. What does that look like, to delight with God? What does it mean to delight with God? Jeremiah 15, 16 says this, and I don't have it. Oh, that opened up really nicely, actually. Good deal. 15, 16 says this. Jeremiah says, when your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. Jeremiah's saying, I take it in. I take you in, Jesus. I take your word in. They're like honey on my lips. There's a sweetness to being with you delighting with you. Now, here's what's interesting, and I've mentioned this before, I think, but, but when, you, when I get to counsel young couples as they're getting ready to get married, and I get to you know, do some premarital counseling with them and talk to them and ask them questions, and then on the big day, you know, you know what's not in their relationship that much that when I look at people who have been married 40 and 50 and 60 years, even 10 years, like, you know what is not in that, mess, or in that relationship that is in the ones that got some history to it? Silence. There's no silence. They are always talking. They are talking nonstop. Walking down the hallway, talking. Now, now, now you get it if you've been married for a while or were married for a while. There's a thing with intimacy that comes with it, silence. And not the kind of silence you're thinking about, not like, I can't stand him anymore, I don't wanna hear him anymore, I'm just tired. I'm not, not that silence. But when you get in the car to go somewhere and the radio's not even on and you don't have to fill the space because there's intimacy there. There's a deep abiding there. That's our, not that we don't use words, we still use words in those relationships, but we can also rest in the silence. On Sabbath, one of the ways that I love to rest with God and delight with God, and I don't practice it every time, but, but I wake up in the morning and I try to read scripture that I've, I've you know, deeply read before. It's usually the Psalms. It's where I'm at on the Sabbath. 
And for my job, obviously, I read the Bible every day for work, and I read it every day for just my own journey with God. But when I read it for work, it's, it's understanding the Hebrew and the Greek and all the backstory and the context of where it was and what was happening, who they were talking to, and why they were doing that. Like, if, if, men, if you come to Quest tonight, we're jumping into James. We're gonna have a whole time of all the context of where James is and why he's writing it where, before we even jump into the book for Quest. But on the Sabbath, I just rest. And my favorite thing, if I can do it, on moments, and I haven't done it in a, in a few months because of the heat outside, but is to wake up early and go for a walk. I mean, the trees are beautiful. They're all dead right now, but they are beautiful. <laughs> I looked at my wife, I was like, it looks like fall. She's like, they're dead. Uh, I was like, well, they look brown. Uh, but walking throughout creation, and not having to spend a lot of time talking to God. I can, it's not that I don't wanna to talk to him, but I can lift up my thankfulness and lift up his goodness and just abide with him, as we've talked about John 15, just abide with him. So on your Sabbath, figuring out ways to delight with God. The second is this, delight in how God made you. This is the uniqueness, this is where you get to be creative. This is where you get to be an artist. This is where you can tell me I'm gonna delight like this and I can ask you one or two questions. I think that's a really good way to delight with God. Maybe that's hosting people to your house to have a dinner. That's delighting with God. Maybe it's going for a walk. Maybe it's one good movie. Not a full day of movies, but one good movie. Maybe it is going and, and, and calling the parent or the aunt or the uncle or the kids who aren't around anymore. They've moved away. Maybe it's a good book. I talked to one lady earlier. She goes, I love to do the adult coloring books. And I said, those stress me out so much. <laughs> I've tried them. Tried them on a plane one day. And I just threw it away on the plane. Like I couldn't even, it was too much. But how do you delight with how God has made you? Now, parents in the room, you'll get this. I've got a four-year-old. I've talked about her a lot, and I'll continue to talk about her a lot. And the other day, she was in the living room. We had just had lunch. She came back in the living room. She was playing. She's got those magnet things, you know, that like build everything. And so she is like, like a thousand of them or whatever. She's all building everything. And I look over and she's doing something I've never seen her do before. And we've never talked about this. We've never communicated about this. She's never seen pictures of this, nothing. But she's doing something that I've never seen, but I know what it is. And so I take my phone out and I take a picture of it. And not to embarrass her, I'm not gonna show you the picture. But I took the picture of it and I sent it to my mother and my father, and I said, I wonder where she got this from. Now, we know this as parents. We will never communicate things to our children, and yet they begin to do the very thing that we did growing up. They'll start wanting to dress a certain way or watch a certain thing or have questions about a certain subject or whatever. Now, here's what my daughter was doing. We had just had lunch, full lunch. She was good. She, was, she had taken her collar out and pulled it out and she was just chewing on it. She had ruined the shirt in like five minutes, you know? And, and what I knew was that from the time I was like five years old in the first soccer game and baseball game I played to much later in life, anytime I played sports, I would just chew on my collar. I don't know what it was. I don't know what happened. I've been to counseling. I'm sober now. Um, we're doing really good. Um, I don't ruin shirts as much. But, but I, would, I mean, my mom and dad would get so angry at me and we've never told Emmy about it. But there she was just chewing on her shirt. I say that to say this. There are ways that your father in heaven has put in you to connect with him. That's parts of him. That's unique to who you are. Yes, we all have scripture. Amen, thank God. We all have prayer. Amen, thank God. But there are specific God given things to you as his son and his daughter to connect with him. And the journey to find those is an adventure. It's an adventure to find those. So we delight with God. We delight in how God made you. And then finally, we delight with God in community. We're supposed to be together in this. Our faith is both an individual thing and an external thing. 
It's both individual piety and trying to become like Jesus and also walking with others and carrying others' burdens and, and walking alongside life and sharing meals together and doing life together. Every time, if you've joined the church since I've been here, I'll, I'll meet you in the back room and, and you'll fill out the form. And one of the things I say to every single person that's joined this church is this is a really large church and God has blessed us with a lot of stuff and a lot of incredible opportunities. And you can come in here on Sunday mornings and sit on the back row and attend the service and then leave and never be seen, never be known, never be no, walk with people. But there, one of the benefits of the size of our church and the ministries offered here and the love and grace poured out is everybody has a place here. There is a place for you here to be involved, to be known, to walk alongside people, to lift them up, to be encouraged, to delight in community with each other. And delight is how we honor God. Delight is how we honor God. Hear this from, I'm gonna flip it, I'm gonna pull this up. Zephaniah 317, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt you over with loud singing. Out of Psalms, he brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. My friends, we delight in God because he first and foremost and continuously delights in us. Have you thought about that? That the one who spoke light into darkness, the one whose baby's cry broke in Bethlehem, the one who walked out of the grave, the spirit of God who came on Pentecost, delights does it put up with? Isn't that like proverbial thing which every kid hates to hear that yes, or that we feel like yes, our parents love us but they are disappointed in us? Numbers tells us that his countenance towards us for us that are hidden in Christ is that of approval and love and joy. I don't think we think about this. That God the only one true God delights in you. He wants to spend time with you. He wants just to be present with you. He wants you to acknowledge his presence. Sabbath is not about escaping simply this world, but connecting and delighting with God. That is the call. Paul has something to say about this in Galatians, and we'll end here today. Chris McLean, who's one of my uh, just really good friends here on staff, um, he, he said the other day, we were, he's preaching today, and th th thank you for not going to hear Chris. Um, and uh, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, Chris is preaching this morning, so we, were, we share offices very close to each other, and in the doing so, we were just sharing about our sermons that we were both gonna preach on Sunday. And you're right, it was riveting conversation. And, uh, and so we're sharing our sermons, and he said this, he goes, Pierce, when the table is present, and baptism is present. May they speak louder than any words you speak. I just love that. Love that. May these elements speak louder than whatever I speak. May that water and that confirmation, that baptism speak louder than anything I speak. So how do you choose what you delight in? Well, we delight in God. We delight with how God made us. But how do you choose the activity? How do you choose the thing? Like, what am I actually gonna do, Pierce? I wake up in the morning, I spend some time with Jesus, go for a walk. What am I gonna do? What's the thing? Well, that's where you get to be the artist. But here's some boundaries for you. Here's some guardrails. Paul says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have been crucified with the flesh and its passions and its desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. So how do I choose what I delight in? Well, what brings the fruit of the Spirit out in my life? What's the thing that when I practice them, it's not about earthly passions and 
earthly desires, but, but what are the things that, that when I pursue them, they actually bring in me a delight that produces love and joy and peace and forbearance, self-control, gentleness and kindness. What are those things? Last week, uh, or two weeks ago, um, Karen and myself and five other pastors that got ordained at our GMC conference this summer got honored by kind of our church staff, and, and we got a gift. It was a journal, and I got the journal, and I took it home, and I write every morning, but usually what I'm writing is I'm studying, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm studying scripture. So I have a process of, of studying scripture. I read the scripture passage, and then it's called SOAP, Scripture observation, what did I observe in the scripture text, application, how does, what do I observe, apply to my life today, and then a P stands for prayer. Just, that's kind of my rhythm. So I got this journal, and, and there was just something within me that God said, I, don't want you, I want you to use this journal, but I don't want you to use it for that. Keep doing that differently. I said, okay, what do you want me to do with this? He goes, I just want you to journal. I just want you to write. Whatever's on your heart, write it. And so September was... Um, it was a few days before the beginning of September, so I started writing, and I made a, I made a promise to God. I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this for a month. Let's just see kind of what, what comes up out of journaling every morning. And, uh, and so I've been journaling every day. Not every morning, I try, but some days it's in the afternoons, and some days it's long, and some days it's short, and, but I journal. And it was driving into the church the other day after spending some time with Jesus and journaling and reading and stuff. And he just reminded me. He just like revealed it to me, right? Like he does sometimes. And he said, the times that you have been the closest with me, the closest with me, you've been journaling. And I was like, you're right. I look back over my life, he's right. The seasons in which I journaled, I just gave things to the Lord every day, gratitude and praise and thanksgiving, but also struggles and burdens and sin. When I had a rhythm of that in my life, I was walking the closest with him. And so I was like, all right, God, here it is, daily practice now. You've revealed it to me. You showed it to me. I can't go back now. This is gonna be a daily practice because I wanna be close. I wanna delight in you and I want to know that you delight in me. I don't know what yours is. Journaling, walking, a good meal, coloring, a good movie, a good book, a good phone call. But my friends, we delight in God on the Sabbath. We delight in how he made us. And we do it in community as well. But please hear me. This is not a striving to delight to get his approval. It is a delighting with him because he delights in you. May we not forget that. That our Father our Savior, and the Holy Spirit that lives within us delights in you as his children and has created you with special gifts and passions and love and interest in which you delight in him. So may we this week delight in him. May we find the ways that he has called us to that. And let's try things and go, you know what? Cooking's not my thing. Journaling's not my thing. Perfect. Find yours. Let us pray. So Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for the table. Oh God, we thank you for the table. Where we get to delight in you. Remember who you are. Be restored, ask for forgiveness. Be reminded that before what we do for you, it's who we are to you and who we are in you. We are the belovedness of Christ. Thank you for the waters of baptism that speak that identity over each one of us this morning. It was delight when Jesus was baptized. It was delight spoken. This is my son in whom I love and am well pleased in whom I delight with. May you stir our hearts, God, stir our faith, stir our love for you. And may we know that it's all a response to what you have first poured out and given to us. 
give our hearts and minds creative spaces to see the ways you have created us, to uniquely, individually, and maybe as a family, and as a community, delight in you. You are our treasure. In your name we pray.